Welcome to Tree Talking Time, where we talk all things tree dogs. From the smallest fights to the largest hounds, drink squirrels to bears and everything in between. And from time to time, we might even run a little fast game. You make more friendships doing this than you ever thought you would. That's right. That's right. That's right. But I mean, you know, it's it's an adrenaline for these people. And I walk on my front porch and look straight at Plot Mountain. So, yeah. Well, I'm here tonight with Jeremy Messer of Lickstone Kennels. How are you doing tonight, Jeremy? I'm doing great. So, where are you from? I, uh, I live in Waynesville, North Carolina. Okay. For somebody that's not a North Carolina native. Roughly, where is that? Or the uh, Great Smoky Mountains of North Carolina. There we go. But that's not where you're at right now, is it? No, I'm on the East Coast of North Carolina right now. Okay. You do a lot of traveling back and forth? Yes, I do a lot. We'll get into a little bit more about that in a, in a few minutes. But how'd you get into hounds? I've been hound hunting my whole life. Okay. You know, as a kid, I started out, you know, my dad and you know, uh, I grew the love for it, and the passion for it, and just kept going with it. Now, what kind of hounds were you running as a kid? Oh, well, we were, I mean, we'd bear hunt, we'd coon hunt. Uh, he'd rabbit hunt, you know, rabbit hunt a little bit, but uh, mainly we would done more coon hunting than bear hunting. Okay. So tell me a little bit about your business, Lickstone Kennels. Uh, it's a hound training business. I do the training bear dogs for people. Okay. You know, they'll send me dogs from, you know, them being green, not knowing nothing to just, you know, getting them in shape. Okay. Uh, you know, we work them on every aspect from rigging, trailing, tree and bay and packing, handling, you know, we do everything. So, you know, we, it takes time, but, you know, we work with dogs. So how long, what's the average time frame you have a dog? Oh, on the average, you know, people send them to me for a month, and I've had some that, you know, to leave them two or three months. I've had one person, you know, actually a couple people leave them, you know, six or seven months. Wow. So, yeah. What made you want to get into training hounds for other people? The passion and the love for the sport. Yeah. You know, I, you know when I, before I started doing that, before I started training full time, I worked power company, and, you know, I just, the, uh, the drive was there, and I told my wife one day, I said, I'm going to try this. She said, okay. And so I tried it, and, you know, it's been going great since. That's awesome. So since you obviously do a lot of training, any sort of tips or advice on training a hound? Everybody's different. You know, what I might do might not be what everybody else does. The best thing to do is look for a dog that's got brains and drive and the willpower to hunt. Okay. They got to have a heart. You can take any hound out there, and if it has the features, you can make a hound out of it. Okay. But, I mean, you got to be the, – the biggest thing is, is if you can handle a dog. There we go. Sorry. I, Lost you. <laughs> I had a phone call come in. Sorry. Oh, okay. But, uh, you know, as long as, as long as they've got brains to them and you can handle the dogs and they're not stupid crazy. Mm-hmm. You can make a dog of whatever caliber if you want. Okay. It just takes a lot of time. Some mm-hmm. dogs learn faster than others. And, you know, some dogs learn real quick. <laughs> gotcha. So what's the biggest reward out of what you do now? At the end of the day, knowing when the dog goes home and the customer messages me or call me and say, hey, you've done a great job with my dogs and I'm going to be sending you more dogs. That's awesome. That's the reward. It's not mm-hmm. about how many buyers you treat a month's time or how many buyers you treat in a year's time. It's about the hound and the mm-hmm. owner of the hound. Y'all, we're all about making them happy. Yeah. So what are, what are some of the biggest challenges that you have to overcome? Oh, man, you get some dogs that just, they ain't ever been handled. You get some that just wants to, push your limits to the max just being stubborn you know want to do what they want to do you know it's just but that's obstacles you overcome you know uh, you just have to work with it you can't get frustrated if you get frustrated you're winning a losing battle 
I mean, because uh, you're you're trying to fight a losing battle. You have to have patience with a dog. Mm-hmm. If you don't have patience with a dog, that dog senses that, and you're not going to get nowhere. I can attest to some of that. I've, I've seen that, and I'm not a dog trainer by any means, but I guess the best way to explain it is you got to have an alpha of the pack, and you can't let the dog be the alpha. You have to be the alpha of that pack to teach him. And along with whenever you take control and you're the alpha of that pack, they'll listen to you and they'll do to make you happy. Because at the end of the day, that's all the, that's all the dog wants to do. He wants to make the owner happy. So you said you travel a lot back and forth between the coast and where, in your home. Why is that? We have in uh, North Carolina, you can train year-round on private land. Okay. So we have a bunch of private land leased. On the coast of North Carolina, so we get to run year round. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Where the mountains, you know, mountains, it's harder to find big chunks of private land together mm-hmm. because it's all divided up. But on the coast, you know, it's easier to find. So is a lot of your uh, ground in the mountains public land then, or? Yeah, I mean, some you know, some of it is, and we do have private land, but it's just then you got the park. You know, you don't want to to do stuff to make people mad you know mm-hmm. you want to try to do everything to keep people on your side than against you yep how many days a year do you think you put in the woods uh from january to mid-march i'm not doing nothing i'm, I'm taking time off the rest of the time i'm in the woods okay so it's you know at least three quarters of the year mm-hmm. i'm in the woods it's a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we take the, it's like I said, January, February, about half of March off just to, it gets in the coldest part of the winter and just let dogs rest. And then when the bears start moving again, then we start back to training. Okay. Now to train these hounds, I'm imagining you have your own pack of hounds. Yes, sir. How many hounds do you run? Oh, my own pack. I've got, I'll play, I've got 12 at home and getting ready to have a litter of puppies on the ground. Okay. Yeah. What do you mostly run? I own plots. Okay. That's, that's what I run. Any particular reason you like plots over anything else? I've hunted with everything and I've, I've owned a lot of, I've owned red bones. I've owned English dogs. I've owned, you name it, I've owned it. If it's out there, I've owned it. But it seems like to me that the plots, they're more a better all-around dog than any other dog. And their feet seem to be tougher also. You're just from North Carolina. It's just a state bias, isn't it? Well, I mean, yeah, you know. <laughs> actually, uh, I can walk on my front porch and look straight at Plot Mountain. So, yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. So, how would you get into guiding hunts? I used to help a boy on the East Coast. We would come down and hunt with him, and he'd have some people come in, you know, to hunt. And so, you know, started helping him. I mean, he wouldn't do a whole lot, you know. So we'd have him guide two or three people, you know, during hunt season. And, uh, you know, it kind of benefited us because we didn't have to use our bear tag. You know, they could use their bear tag. So, you know, it's kind of beneficial, you know. Even if we did tag out, we could still go hunting and, hey, you know, there's a tag there. Somebody, you know, if they want to kill a bear, they can. And if not, you know, pull dogs off and go on. Mm-hmm. You know, when I started training, I told my wife, I said, I think I'm going to, you know, try to do the guiding part. And I did. And so far, it's been successful. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm in as far as people killing bears. I am probably in the 90 percentile, if not the upper 90s. There's a couple of times last year, you know, it was just pouring the rain real bad on the coast and a lot of water. And I mean, the dogs just couldn't smell, I'm, you know, but that was weather factors. But other than that, you know, I put bears in front of the customers and they're happy. Awesome. From what I've heard about coastal North Carolina, I heard bears are everywhere down there and they're huge. They are. They are. My wife actually killed a Boone and Crockett bear this year, this past year. Wow, that's awesome. Yes, yes. Yes. And, uh, you know, she was tickled to death and we had dogs on it too. And I was killed at five foot from the road. So, (laughs) wow. We got lucky. We got lucky on that one. 
Yeah. But uh, the, and there, the there's a lot of there's a lot of bears like that down here. You know, you have to just to manage them. You you can't kill your little ones. You got to manage your bears. You know, you got to mm-hmm. let them get big if you want them bears. Yeah. So when you're guiding now, it's all for yourself, right? Yes. Okay. So how many hunters do you take? You know, per year now. Uh, average uh, about ten hunters per year. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not a ton. You know, because I don't want to try to take away from the boys that help me either. You know, I want them to be enjoyed also. How many dogs do you guys train a year? Oh, wow. Let me try to do the math on that. That's a good question. I ain't never kept up with it, to be honest <laughs> with you. Uh, you know, we're averaging between 20 to 25 dogs a month. So you're looking at. Well, you said you take a few months off. So you're looking at probably at least 200 dogs a year. Over that. Uh, yeah, I'm probably saying, yeah, you know, probably close to 300, I would say. Wow. Yeah. Now you said, you know, a little bit, we were just talking a little bit before we started recording. And you said uh, you got a couple guys that are helping you now. Yes. 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 They're good dog handlers too. You know, they've been, uh, uh, they've been bear hunting for several years. They know how to handle dogs. So, uh, you know, they fit the, they fit the job very well. Mm-hmm. I don't have to, if something come up and I had to go home, you know, family, whatever, I could leave here and not have to worry about it and know everything's still done right. That's great. Uh, having good help. Yes. So got any good client stories? Oh, wow. Uh, like which, like for hunting or what? Either. <laughs> he says either. Well, I, I've had, I've trained some guys for some boys that, uh, I knew, and they come down here and they hunt with us, and uh, they couldn't believe how big of buyers we had down here. And then we run a lot at nighttime because it gets so hot down here. Yeah. And, you know, it's cooler on dogs. And this elderly man, I, I'm not going to say real elderly, he's in his 60s, you know, he could still get through the woods. And uh, he was from Virginia, and he's like, man, I like to see one of these big buyers up a tree. So we got one up a tree. But little did he know he come up close and personal with it when he got to the tree, he wanted to have his picture made with it. <laughs> and they turn around and it's right there about head high looking at him. Yeah. <laughs> he he didn't know what to do. But I mean, you know, he enjoyed the time. So mm-hmm. and I you know, hunting stories I have seen I've watched guys first time bear hunting and they love it. You know, it's they don't know what to think of it. Yeah. But I have a man that comes every year and he brings his father with him and they do mountain hunts. And it's just, he told me when he started this, he said, I've never done a hound hunt. Never. He said, I've always stand in it. And he said, I'm going to take a chance and do a hound hunt. Well, he has killed a bear every year he's been with me. He's been coming to me. This will be his sixth year. Wow. That's awesome. And when he showed up, he said, uh, he talked to him, but he said, I take my dad with me. I said, that's fine. And when he showed up, he said, you know, man, he said, it's not about me killing a bear. He said, it's about me spending time with my dad and making memories. Mm-hmm. And that sticks with me every time. Yeah. Because people take it for granted what they have here on earth and it can be taken away from any time. Exactly. Whatever you can do to, to keep the memories, do it. You know, so a lot of people, a lot of people ain't able to, you know, they mm-hmm. lost their father or, you know, they, they just ain't got the time to spend with them. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't take it for granted because it can be taken away in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. Now, have you had any like bad client interactions? I've been very fortunate. Everybody that I have had come hunt, they're, they're, you know, they're the working class people. They are hunters you know they're just not here for just a shoot to get a trophy okay. you know they're here to do the full experience like when i do a hound hunt they're like you know we come to kill a bear but we really want to experience the hound part of it that's awesome so it's like you know it brings in a whole new clientele and at the end of their hunt they're happy you mm-hmm. know because they get to experience something they never got to experience before yeah now, cause I know quite a few people like that have been to Canada and stuff. And it's like, they go with the whole intention of killing a bear. You know, they go yeah. to a, 
sit on a bear on a bait bear, which you know is fine, whatever. But that is that's the whole thing. If they don't kill a bear, I mean, it's almost like a wasted trip to them. Yes, and that's great that your clients, you know, aren't coming to you just to kill a bear. They're coming for the experience as well. Yeah, and you know, the good thing with a hound hunt is if you tree a bear and they don't want it, then they ain't got to take that one. They have other chances, you know. With this, with a still, with a stand hunt, you don't know what's coming. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. might sit there for I, don't, I mean I don't know. They might do a five day hunt, and let's say on the fifth day, five minutes left of shooting time. That's when the bear comes in. With a hound hunt, hey, you know you might see two or three bears in one day. Yeah. So you've got the option, you know, and they get to and they get to experience it too. And it's not just tree and a bear. I mean, we get on the bay and bears, you know, that walk and you have to go in and, you know, harvest them on the ground. But it's an experience as they remember. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, you hear them talk about it. They get, they get back to the lodge and they're like, wow, you know, this dog, that was really fun, you know. So at the end of the day, that, that means more to me than them really harvesting a bear because they got to see what, we always push as houndsmen for saying it's a sport, and a lot of people don't get it until they try. Yeah, They're, you know, because they want to take that heritage away, and it's a heritage. Yep. Now, that, like them same boys that I, I said, you know, I've been to Canada. But, they're like, oh, well, that ain't hunting. You know, you're following a dog. I'm like, I put a lot more work in when I bear hunt than you guys. And I mean, I'm like, that's fine. That you, that's what you want to do. Just don't tell me that I'm not that I'm not doing something of equal value. You know. Exactly. And they don't realize the work that goes into it. Mm-hmm. And I, I try to tell people that it's not just, oh, you go out here and throw a dog in a truck and go out here and throw it in the woods and catch a bear. Yep. No, it, it's not that. You have to train that dog. You have to spend gas money. You have to spend money on good boots. You have to spend money on tracking systems. You got to spend money on good dog food. And then you got vet bills. It's a whole. It's just not, hey, go out here and do this. They don't realize the time and money that we put into this. Oh, yeah. And if they ever come to experience it, they would have a different outlook. Yep. I completely agree with you. So now most of your clients, are they non-hound hunters already? So this is like a completely new thing to them? Yeah. I mean, well, I've had people who come that have squirrel hunted with dogs, you know, because they ain't got no bear season where they live. So they're like, but we like to do a hound hunt because we do mess with dogs. Okay. And we have some that, that show up that has never done a hound, you know. Mm-hmm. They're like, this is all new to us. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to go on. And then when I get here and they experience it, they really like it. That's awesome. I, I guess I've never really had that experience of hunting with too many people that are completely green to it. You know, most of the time when I hunt with other people, it's they've got dogs or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's, you know, when you got somebody that's green to it, they're going to ask you 10 million questions within, within an hour. It's <laughs> like, what does this do? What does that mean? What, what does this dog do? You know, how do you know? It's just, it's repeating. You know, I said, you will learn when these dogs strike a track, they rig a track. We're going to get out, try to find it, put down on it, let the dogs trail it up. You know, then they trail it, and they have to jump it. When they jump it, then we put more dogs to it. And then they go and run it. And then you got the whole process. Well, it's going across the road here. So you got to get over here. Or if they start baying and they start boogering at it, they're like, well, what's that? I'm, well, it's on the ground. So we might have to kill this on the ground. And then they're like, oh, we got to get that close. Yeah, come on. We, this, you know, <laughs> let's go. Yep. They don't realize it. They think it's just go out here and run a bear up a tree, but it's not. Oh, yeah. I've actually been to coastal North Carolina on a hog hunt. That's not, that's some rough country. It is very thick, very thick. You got the reeds, the brars, you got the swamps, you got, you know, you be crawling through bear tunnels to get the bears. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's not a cakewalk. I yeah. mean, but it's enjoy. It's an adrenaline, you know, yep. it gets you. If you don't get excited doing it, you don't need to be doing it. I, I got lucky something. when I went hog hunting down there, uh, we weren't maybe, maybe 75 yards off of, off the bank. We were actually on a boat, and uh, but the guy that went with me, he uh, he lost a boot and fell in the mud, and he's like, "You just left me." I'm like, "I was going to the dogs. I had no idea you weren't behind me." That's right. That's right. That's right. 
But I mean, you know, it's it's an adrenaline for these people, and once they experience it, they love it. You know, mm-hmm. and I get it every time. Every time we turn a dog loose, because not every bear is the same. It's always going to be something different. Yeah. So you don't know what you're getting to experience whenever you turn that dog loose. Now, seeing you have so many big bears, do you get a lot of walking bears, or? Yes, we get a lot of walking bears. It's kind of what I've heard. Yes, yes, and you know, you don't want something that's just going to go in our head strong and try to catch it like they do a hog, but you want something that's going to hold it at bay. Yeah. You know, if it breaks to run, you want it where it's going to grab it. You know, try to stop it again. You know, or lay or, or put enough pressure to it, it's going to make a tree. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you don't want want to know what we call cheerleaders. Yeah. You know, if if you got a cheerleader, you ain't ever going to catch a bear. Yeah. So you know, you you got to have something that's up there doing the job. For anybody listening, can you explain what a cheerleader is? Yeah, I guess they don't know. <laughs> okay, you you got your dogs that are up there within two or three to six inches of that bear paying it, you know, right right there trying to to pinch on it, you know, to make it agitated, to make it hold there, and then you got them that stand back 15, 20 foot barking at it. Yeah, the ones that are back 15, 20 foot there, we call them the cheerleaders. Because they ain't got the courage to get up there to do it. Yeah. So with training dogs, do you do you see a lot of dogs that don't make it? Yeah. Okay. We really do. We really do. And it's not because they're mistreated or that, you know, we're not getting on chances. You can take it. I mean, every dog is not going to make a bear dog. And I try to mm-hmm. explain that to people. Everybody's like, well, it's bred this way, it's bred that way. In my eyes, and I mean, a lot of people think it's different, and, it, and I might step on people's toes right here, but a, I have never seen a set of papers tree a bear. Yep. I have yep. never. So at the end of the day, it don't matter how long their papers are or how well bred that dog is. It's up to that dog to do it. Mm-hmm. You can take a mixed up hound and a lot of them turn out better than pure bread ham. Yeah. You know? And but some people don't want it because it's not pure bread. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, I wouldn't care if it was a poodle trend bear as long as it's doing its job. <laughs> you know? So and and I mean, you know, yeah, you know, I do I do favor, you know, plots, but I've owned walkers, I've owned black, like I said, I've owned everything. But that's what I go to because I have better luck out of it. But I mean, we've took dogs in before, time after time after time, night after night, and you can show them bears, and they just don't—they don't care. You know, they have no need to do it. So you know, and you tell the people and be honest about it. And at the end of the day, they can do. You know, if they want to keep messing with it, they can. Or if they want to put it on a coon, you know, that—that's all up to them. Yeah. But you know, if we can get everybody on the same page about that world be a whole lot better <laughs> gotcha i'm just saying you figure average hunter that you know you have a few you're, you're bound to have a dog a time or two in your life that's not going to make it you know yeah. depending on how many dogs you keep but with you having so many that's why i kind of figured you you saw it a little more often than the average guy yeah you do you know and what i might not like somebody else might like mm-hmm. you know i tell everybody i said your standards may not be as high as mine. I said, but for what I do, my standards is, uh, is very high. I expect them, if they rig that bear, I expect that bear to be caught. Yeah. You know? And if I'm not saying it's going to, because there's times it won't be, but it makes me mad because they didn't meet that standard. You know? And some people's like, well, it's okay. You know, maybe it was too cold or whatever. I'm like, nah, if they rig that bear, they need to catch it. Because at the end of the day, that's what you want to do. You want to catch mm-hmm. a bear. Yeah. You don't want to be out here listening to 15 different rigs so that they've, you know, they've struck 15 different tracks and not be able to catch the first one because mm-hmm. they can't do nothing with it. You want it when they open their mouth, you can catch the bear. No, especially for your business. You now you're trying to provide hounds with opportunity. And you're also, when you're guiding, you're trying to provide hunters with the opportunity to see a bear. So I can definitely understand why. Yeah. You expect 
Yeah, yeah. Because if you settled for mediocre dogs, your own pack, then what you train is only going to ever be mediocre. That's right. That's right. You know, you want, I want everybody who's in the hound world. It don't matter what they're running. I want them to have the best of the best. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, we're all in it for the same thing. And it's to have fun and catch game. Whatever game we're running, we want to catch it. Mm -hmm. Because we're about the dogs. It's not about the kill. It's about the dogs. Mm Mm-hmm. I th- we want to watch them dogs perform. We want to watch and see what they do. That way we know what we have. What if, if we do go to breed, maybe what traits will carry over or what won't, you know? Mm-hmm. That's stuff you look at for all the time. You know, that's why I, ha- I have so that's why I have such a high standard. You know, a lot of people want a uh, cold nose rig dog. Myself, I don't. I want a medium nose. That way I know if I if if we rig, if we rig that bear, we're gonna catch it. You know, you got a cold nosed dog. He might babble on a track for four or five hours before you get it jumped, or even if he ever gets it jumped. When you could keep a rigging on around and find something hotter and put on, have it killed before he gets the bear jump. You know, we've seen that a whole lot. A lot of it depends on where you're at, and it sounds like you've got enough bear down there that you're better off just to move on over a a real old track. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let it be to the next day, you know, or or two or three days later. Because mm-hmm. I mean, it's going to show back up mm-hmm. within your own pack. You know, you said you got a litter of puppies coming. What do you look for in in you know your next generation? What are you breeding for? I'm breeding for everything. I'm breeding, you know, for mm-hmm. nose. You know, I I do. I breed for it all. I mean, everybody wants that. Am I say I'm going to get it? No. The cross I made is out of my best brood female and then my best male. And I know both what they, I mean, they both got great noses the whole nine yards. So you hope that carries over. Am I saying it's going to? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Everybody wants it to carry over, but at the end of the day, nobody knows until them pups get up big enough to you can start messing with them. Yep. People don't understand that. They're like, well, these are going to come out great. They might not. You don't know. Oh, yeah. No, I've had quite a few dogs that were bred right and just never amounted to anything. But, you know, litter mates did and they just didn't. It happens. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so far, everything that's come out of the female that I've bred has been doing great. But who's to say it's going to happen this time? Mm -hmm. You know, am I not? I mean, the litter might not be worth nothing. Who knows? If it ain't, you just you start over again, you know? Mm-hmm. But you always need young dogs coming on. That way, if you get any killed or, you know, any hurt, you need young dogs coming on to carry it on what you, yeah. what you, what you have built on. Mm-hmm. Always keep building on for the next time and for the next time. Because I've seen it several times. People's like, well, I want to breed out of this dog before they get too old before something happens to them. And before long, it's too late. They either get killed or they wait to so long that they don't take, and then they've lost their chance. Yep. And then they're like, well, what do I do now? Build on what you have. Mm-hmm. That's the only way you can keep it going. Now, how long have you had your line of plots? Oh, I've had these for... Uh, this line I'm doing probably around eight, ten years, you know, how I'm doing these, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. I mean, you know, they're I don't have their papers on them. I mean okay. because pa- papers don't mean nothing. I'm about tree and a bear. But mm-hmm. I know how I know I know how they're bred though. Okay. And so the, you know, they're mixed between different breeds of plot. I I don't I haven't line bred them. I just okay. I take the best of the best. Breed them together, and ninety-eight percent of the time, pups come out good. Okay, you know they end up making dogs. So you know that's that's, but that's how I was taught. Okay, we was always taught, you know, hey, we're gonna take this good dog over here and breed this good dog, and it always worked. So and you know that's what you taught when you're young. That's what we keep doing. Okay, hey, if it's working for you, that's all that matters. Uh, that's right. Now, how how often do you go outside of what you have looking for either getting getting dogs or using outside studs? You know, it just depends. I mean, you know, when I whenever I say outside, I mean we don't ever go outside the group 
You know, okay. we keep everything we keep everything within, but it might not be anything we've ever tried before. Gotcha. So we'll try it and be like, okay, you know, it's like some of the boys that hunt with me, they got mixed up. You know, they've got half plot, half walker. They've tried that and that's worked great. Mm-hmm. I mean, I actually own a half plot, half walker, you know, and she does great. But, you know, it's just that stuff we've tried and it's worked. Yeah. Sometimes some crossbred dogs are work out real well. They do, you know. So like I said, at the end of the day, everybody wants to be able to catch a game. So it don't matter what breed it is. Mm-hmm. As long as that person's happy and catching game, that's all that matters. Uh, my, my best dog's a half plot. <laughs> yeah. We have – we're actually right now, we're training a half plot, half feist. And she's greedy. I mean, she's going to be a feisty little thing. and going to make a little, nice little hound. But that's something that they want to try, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's working for them. I mean, when he said he had that, I'm like, I was looking for a little dog, but (laughs) I mean, it's about a, you know, 35 pound dog. Okay. And it can move. I mean, and it looks like a plot. Yeah. But, you know, that's what they wanted to breed and that's how it turned, you know, that's what they come up with. Mm -hmm. Give us another good story. I don't, whatever comes to mind, a good hunting story. How about I tell you the first time a boy killed his bear? Okay. Uh, he was nine years old. We had uh, run one bear that morning. They got in the park. on, So we got dogs back. And we was actually just sitting on a ridge, eating lunch. And I said, you know, what the heck? I'm just going to turn two older dogs down the ridge and let them hunt while we're eating whatever. We're sitting there eating. My brother-in-law says, hey, I'm going to ride around down low and see if I can find anything or, you know, get anything on them dogs. I said, okay. I never heard the dogs bark none the whole time we was eating. Never heard them. I looked at the GPS. I told them, I said, hey, they're, them dogs are treed down there. I said, when you get down there, they're about 100 yards above the road in, in a rock cliff up there. I said, check them. He got down there and he said, uh, they're treed. He said, let me go up there and I'll tell you if you need to bring your boy in here. I said, all right. He got up there and he said, bring him in there. And uh, so then my little boy said, Daddy, how are we going to get through these rock cliffs to kill this bear? I said, son, this is going to take time. Well, one of my cousins, he's raised down there on the mountain we hunt. He said, we'll go in the back way. It might take a little longer, but we'll go in the back way. So we went across the mountain and come in the back way and got around there. The, I mean, the dogs stayed treed the whole time. The bear was just, you know, content the tree. And we got over there and he said, all right, Dad. He said, I'm ready to shoot this thing. I said, okay. We well, propped up on a little laurel there. And uh, he shot. One shot, it fell out. I mean, he done great. One shot. I want. I think I was more excited than he was. I went to hooping and hollering, you know, just, you know, jumping up and down because that was the first bear he ever harvested. And uh, he looked at me, he said, Dad, Dad. I said, what, son? He said, you calm down? I said, why? He said, because I'm going to go see my bear. <laughs> so <laughs> this whole time he was still calm. And then he got over to it and he lost it. I mean, he went to crying and he went, to, you know, Having a good time, and he hugged me. He said, Dad, he said, this is a memory I'm always going to take with me and cherish. He said that you got to put me on my first bear. Something for a nine-year-old to know that and reflect on that. Yeah, you know, and I mean, he thought deeply in that. And ever, you know, I tell people, I said, you know, it's 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 sad day whenever a nine-year-old can tell you that instead of saying, hey, Dad, you know, thanks. Instead, he said, that's a memory I'm going to cherish the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. And that, that meant more to me than any bear kill, you know, ever. So now I've got twin girls. I ain't pushed them into hunting. Mm-hmm. But the past, this past hunting season, they was there when their mama killed that big bear. And I think in a couple of years, I'll be able to watch them kill theirs. They're starting to get into it. And, you know, to me, Hunting with your family and watching your kids grow up doing it is what it's about. Yep. And if I can sit and say that I've watched all three of my kids kill their first bear, that's going to mean more than anything 
I mean, to me, I have accomplished my goal as their father, taking them hunt that I've cherished in memories with. How old are your daughters? They're eight. Okay. How old's your son now? He's 13. Does he still like hunting with dogs? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, I think he's got a little worse than I do. But yeah, he, yeah, he loves it. He loves awesome. it. Between, between uh, bear hunting, coon hunting, football, and turkey hunting, yeah. If he can do them for and fishing, if he can do all that, he's happy. <laughs> so sounds like a life right there yeah he, he'll keep you busy is what he'll do yeah he, he'll keep you busy but it's okay you know you, you got to put your family and your kids first and mm-hmm. you know when you do good things come i got a, a four-year-old and I, i'm waiting for the day that to be able to take him bear hunting and he likes to look at all the pictures and videos of the dogs i took him coon hunting this year and he, he liked that so a couple more years and that and that means more to you than any other than anything you could ever kill. Whenever you watch mm-hmm. your kid harvest their first animal, that means more to them in, and to you than anything you'll ever kill. Yeah, I've watched him kill deer. I've watched him kill bears. You know, I've watched him kill turkeys. He actually killed he killed a turkey last year, but this past you season last week. He called his first turkey in by himself and killed. Him. Wow, that's awesome. I sit and watched him, you know, but he put his mind to it and he done it. And, you know, that here we are again. It meant more to me to watch him do that than anything else. Yeah, now, that's impressive. He called it, you know, be able to call it in himself and, and to kill it, you know, to be dedicated enough to actually, you know, practice a call and get good enough to actually be able to do it. Yeah, his mama said, I'm going to kill you if I hear that turkey call one more time in the house. <laughs> yeah, because he'll listen and he'll watch videos on YouTube and then he tries to mock the turkey. Yeah. So, you know, that's how he's done it. And he's done great. He's done great. That's awesome. Yep. So what's in store now? Anything new? Anything exciting coming up? Well, we are... Uh, my wife, of course, if you follow the... Outfitter page. She's always making crazy videos. You know, (laughs) she's always she's raffling off hunts, raffling off merchandise, hats, shirts, hoodies, whatever she can do. But uh, no, we're you know we're just looking to you know to grow, you know, to build this up. You know, I'm I'm by means no far trying to get rich. I'm just trying to get something for my kids, you know, Mm -hmm. and to give something to people who ain't able to do it, you know. So we keep working every day toward it, and hopefully, and you know, within the next couple of years, we'll, we'll be to the place where we're happy, and we ain't got to, you know, worry about growing them. You know, we want to mm-hmm. just get to a certain place and just level out and be there. You know, yep. I always try to have your, you know, your peak clientele, and you know, keep making everybody happy and make friendships. You make more friendships doing this than you ever thought you would. Oh, I believe that. And that's that's a, that's a big thing, you know. If you can make the friendships and bond with the people, that means a lot, and mm-hmm. that means a lot to the customer also. So you know, we'll just we we'll keep working toward it. Good deal. Where can people find you? If they want to book a hunt or send you a dog to train. All my stuff's on Facebook. You can get in contact with me by my phone number, which is eight two eight five five zero 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 four eight. Or you can private message me, send me a text. Uh, you can also get up with my wife. Her name is Stacy Messer. Her phone number is 828-593-8110. And, uh, you know, we'll be more than glad to help you. If from dog training to hunts or, if, you know, you got any questions, period, you know, about hunting or about dog training, you know, we, we try to help everybody. You okay. Know? I have people call me all the time. Hey, what would you do if this was your dog? You know, just asking questions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we try to help everybody we can. Well, thank you for taking some time and talking with me tonight. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Tree Talking Media. And until next time, keep them talking in the timber.